Herbert promptly told his broker the following morning that they could not meet their $135 million margin call that day. The Hunt's brokers promptly sold $100 million worth of silver that day. Their account alone had $90 million worth of equity, and they were expected to lose it all the next day. The CFTC chairman, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and the United States Treasury Secretary began round-the-clock silver monitoring sessions. On March 27th, Silver Thursday, silver opened up at $15.80 and closed down at $10.80. The stock market crashed on rumors that the Hunt's liquidations of stocks to cover the silver losses and then rallied to close above the same level. The next day, silver rallied back up to $12. The Hunt's bullion purchases were all averaged around $10, but their futures contracts were purchased around $35. When it was all over, they owed $1.5 billion. On April 2, 1980, the Hunt's owned over 158 million ounces of silver. The Federal Reserve Chairman, Paul Volcker, gave approval for a bailout plan for the brothers fearing a financial disaster. A group of banks agreed to loan the brothers $1.1 billion. The family had to put up $8 billion in collateral with the banks. After the smoke cleared, it appeared that the drama was not just a one-sided manipulation by the Hunts. The shorts in the eastern establishment had just as much at stake as the Hunts did. By the mid-1980s, silver was bumping around $17 an ounce again. Shortly thereafter, Reagan came into the presidency and a new optimism gripped the country. In 1988, Bunker filed for personal bankruptcy. In 1989, he left bankruptcy with a net worth of 5 to $10 million and a debt to the IRS of $90 million to be repaid over 15 years. The Bunker's trusts, set up by his father, H.L. Hunt, were currently valued at $200 million. In 2003, they finally made their last payment to the IRS. One thing people should note is that for all the action in the silver market that the Hunts were doing, it had nothing to do with the gold market, which was clearly responding to the seizure of hostages in Tehran, the occupation of the Great Mosque in Mecca, and the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. The week that Russia invaded Afghanistan, silver rose 50% alone that week from $24 to $36. Bunker later said that it was almost like the silver shorts had the power to manipulate the market, break the market, cost the longs a lot of money, and then turn the media on the longs and brand them as speculators. He thought the media would have been more discerning, but apparently the shorts had a lot of influence on them. I feel there are a lot of lessons here that we can take away from the Hunt story. First and foremost, take possession. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. By taking physical delivery of your metal, it takes away the basis of the illusion. The paper market controls the physical market so long as people believe that these paper contracts actually have physical metal backing them up. Every ounce of metal that leaves their hands has a deleveraging quality to it, meaning that for every one physical ounce, there could be hundreds or thousands of paper ounces that trade upon that. At some point, they will no longer be able to keep up the physical reality of their paper illusion. The other important aspect of taking physical delivery is that this has no counterparty risk. By paying cash and taking delivery of your metal, you do not run the risk of a brokerage firm going bad, a currency becoming worthless, or a market not being able to deliver the metal they promised. If the problem is a fiat illusion, then the solution must be of the opposite consciousness. It must be a physical reality. Do not use leverage. By taking on debt to buy physical silver, you run the risk of being forced out of the market. Markets can remain irrational a lot longer than you and I can remain solvent. Gary Schilling By not using leverage and only paying cash, you do not have to worry about the ups and downs that violently move this market. There's a saying, you cannot cheat an honest man, and holding honest money is the best way not to be cheated. Also, by using leverage, you are playing their game. Everything they do has leverage. Leverage corrupts. So once again, the answer lies in the opposite consciousness. Also, when you don't use leverage, it is a less emotional decision to buy and sell your metal. Having physical metal and seeing the physical reality that went into producing that metal keeps people from making irrational, emotional decisions in the heat of the battle. We are playing for the single largest event in human history, the mathematical collapse of the dollar, and by buying physical metal, it helps you keep your eye on the prize. As we can see in the Hunt story, silver is the Achilles heel of the elite's paradigm. Without the ability to print unlimited amount of money to control the world's banks, corporations, governments, militaries, and citizens, the elite would be powerless. Take away their ability to create money, and you take away their ability to project power. Simply seeing the amount of power that was drawn to bear to stop two men from buying physical silver should be clue enough for us all to commit to buying physical silver. The Hunt story also shows how inelastic the price of silver is. When they first started buying, it was $1.50 an ounce. 
Every time that they made major purchases, the price of silver doubled. The higher the quantity they purchased, the higher the price it went. The fundamentals that were true in the 70s are even more true today. There is far less silver in the world than there was back in 1970, and there's far more money now than there was back in 1980. I think another important point of the Hunt story is that you cannot defeat a collectivist power through central ownership of a metal. Because the Hunts were the major players in the market, all the elite needed to do was to take them down, and the silver market took decades to recover. The only true solution is decentralized, non-violent, non-compliant, leaderless resistance, buying and stacking silver on a local level. Knowing that there is so much power derived off of this single metal, you cannot play in their casino or by their rules. So long as you play by the elite's rules, they will rule. The Hunts had a pretty good idea about how powerful the Rockefellers were, and yet time and time again, they were outmaneuvered by the Rockefellers, both domestically, institutionally, and internationally. The only way to defeat a power like that is to change the rules and work outside the system. You cannot expect to get a fair fight when they own the referees and can change the rules whenever they see fit. There is far too much power at risk. The closer you get to your target, the more dangerous it will become. When you truly understand who and what you're up against, the criminal elite will stop at nothing to ensure their power. These are men that are complicit in genocide and the theft of the wealth of nations. They are known for changing the rules and changing your reality. That is why the best course of action is to do something outside of their area of expertise. They thrive in secrecy. We must expose them and share this information. They thrive in a centralized fiat system. We must take decentralized action and buy physical. They gain power by spreading debt and death throughout the world. We must secure our future with real tangible equity and sharing information with peace and understanding. For the major silver players out there, do not underestimate what you are going up against. The Hunt brothers knew full well that they were dealing head on with the Rockefellers, and yet they decided to play in their casino in the markets that Washington and Wall Street controlled. Even overseas, the New York and Washington establishment has a lot of power, as seen with the assassination of King Faisal and the failed deal with President Marcos when the IMF killed the deal. The Hunts also sought to get a fair trial in the media, which of course is controlled by the New York and Washington crowd. As I showed in The Greatest Truth Never Told, you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. What the Hunt brothers were trying to do with their silver bullet and silver shield plan is something that we can all do together. Collectively, we can have just as much influence as the Hunts did, except there's no way to stop us. As the Hunt brothers' story showed, by taking physical delivery, we can play outside the rules and provide a non-violent, non-compliance shift in power that will change the world forever. It is very important to understand that the manipulation of the gold and silver market is a very deliberate one by those that seek to enslave you. If the paper price of silver and gold are severely lower than their actual value, the paper money that the United States and its banks issue is theoretically more valuable relative to gold and silver than it really is. If you push down the price of metals, the US dollar and all of the paper assets that it underlies goes up. This is our current situation, and things that cannot go on forever won't.